Namaste and welcome. Today, it is my great honor to introduce Dr. Rohit Chandra, who is a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist at AMGH Chelsea. He's also the instructor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and uh, he also serves on the board of volunteering for seniors and on the board of teen mental health initiative. A very passionate actor. He loves to act in the Setu place and also serves as a judge for the annual India International Film Festival in Boston. Dr. Chandra is born and raised in Long Island, New York and has lived in Boston area for many, many years. Welcome to Lokwani Rohit, Namaste. Namaste. Thank you, Ranjani Ji. Wonderful to be here. Pleasure is all ours. And today, um, we are really going to talk to you about uh, trying to demystify mental health. The past two years have been a little challenging for everybody, arguably, you know, as we are moving into the new normal from the pandemic and all of that. And, uh, you know, mental health has uh, got a little focus, I would say, um, in this thing. And what I wanted to start out by asking is that, uh, you know, we all have the blues sometimes. Um, and yet, um, you know, we don't need to go to the doctor for every time we have the blues. So how do you know when you really are in a position where you may need some help? Right, great point. Um, so I think, you know, yeah, so certainly sadness is a part of life. Uh, when we lose a loved one, you know, we experience grief. Uh, you know, anytime we experience some sort of loss, you know, there is some sadness. If we fail to perform like we wanted to on a test, we might feel sad or frustrated. So, you know, negative emotions are a part of life, no question. Um, I think the answer to your question is really when, um, when something becomes severe, uh, in terms of intensity or is really long lasting and shows no signs of going away. Uh, and, and in general, you know, function is usually affected. So if, um, if the blues are such that someone, you know, is thinking about ending their life, if the person is, you know, not sleeping, not eating, can't concentrate, you know, feeling worthless about themselves, then it's probably more than just regular blues. Uh, also, if, if um, you know, if someone has been feeling down, you know, in a low mood for an extended period of time, then you have to really, you know, start to worry. Um, so I think instinctively we may get these things, but, you know, some of our um, sort of cultural beliefs might get in the way, uh, such as, you know, mental illness was not very common in the India that you grew up in. Uh, it probably is more common in the U.S. Uh, for, you know, we're not sure exactly what reasons, but... Um, you know, the collective Indian culture may have been protective uh, and America is very individualistic and that can be kind of stressful. Uh, so that may be one reason, there may be other reasons as well. But, um, you know, often when, when um, you know, when people come from India, you know, they find that there is you know, there's a higher rate of mental illness in America uh, and that can be confusing. Uh, so I think just recognizing that uh, if something, you know, if, if a condition, whether sadness, you know, whether someone is really sad or really anxious or, you know, is uh, the mood is too elevated for an extended period of time, or if it seems like it is severe, yeah. that's when treatment really needs to be sought. Otherwise, sure. I mean, we all feel sad, we all feel anxious, and, you know, we should not be pathologizing normal emotions. So, I mean, it sounds from what you're saying that uh, it really is like any other health condition where, you know, you know when to go to the doctor, when you have a you know, wrist broken, as opposed to just, uh, you know, you're feeling some pain, you stretched your hand too much in a Physically, right. how do you compare, uh, you know, and I was going to ask you that, like when people get the blues, is it a, actually a physical or an organic symptom? You know, does something happen in the brain that makes us feel depressed? Great questions. Um, so to compare physical and mental illness, I think you're quite right. Uh, you know, if I fall down and think I might have broken my arm or sprained my wrist, you know, I'll be fairly quick to go to urgent care. I'll be fairly quick to seek medical attention. Um, and, you know, if I'm a child or if I'm a teen, you know, if I, you know, fall and potentially break my arm or sprain my wrist, you know, my family members will probably be fairly quick to take me to the hospital to figure out what's happening. So we, you know, we are quick to address um, physical illness. We're often not so quick to address, um, you know, emotional problems, behavioral problems, um, things like that, because we often feel like either 
they are maybe an extension of normal, or we feel like maybe it's our fault that these things happened, uh, or we just don't, you know, it's hard for us to really recognize the severity. Mm. Um, you know, there certainly is stigma in the Indian community uh, against mental illnesses. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, in the past, it used to interfere with people's ability to get married, uh, you know, with the bio data we had to submit, you know, it was, you wanted to make sure no one in your family had mental illness. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's not the case in the U.S. Uh, uh, in terms of arranged marriages, they're, they're not very common anymore. So, so it shouldn't be as stigmatized. Um, and, you know, phys physical illnesses, mental illnesses, both are quite treatable. Uh, you asked about, is there an organic component? Can, yeah. can we know that something has become organic? So um, psychiatry, you know, is a little bit different from neurology. Neurology, you can find gross lesions, like major lesions in the brain and the spinal cord through imaging. Um, you can also do tests on the body where you can locate actual lesions. You can say, oh, the nerve bundles in this area have been, um, you know, affected, have been cut perhaps, there's something wrong with them. So there's testing you can do that's fairly objective. Psychiatry, unfortunately, because it involves the micro circuitry of the brain, um, we often don't have proper testing that can really establish where a problem is or um, really what a problem is organically or what's happening organically. Uh, but I mean, there probably are some, uh, you know, there probably is something that, you know, in the next 15 to 20 years, we'll, we will be able to um, find in terms of testing. So at this point, what we have is uh, symptoms, people's symptoms. And it's just important to recognize, you know, where, uh, you know, at what point you really uh, have someone seek treatment, at what point you seek treatment yourself, at what point, um, uh, you know, you have family members seek treatment. So again, severity and then long lasting symptoms uh, that often compromise function. Um, you know, if, if you're, uh, if you're not doing as well in school because you can't concentrate uh, or sad or anxious, if you, your work performance is suffering uh, because you're sad or anxious, can't concentrate, if you're not sleeping properly because of some reason, you know, it's important to really address these, that you, your quality of life is not affected and that you're not suffering. And I think what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, psychiatry is a science like anything else. And, you know, of course, they're learning as they are going along. And there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of help available. I mean, I think that's what I'm hearing from you that, you know, you don't have to assume that when you have a condition of sadness or depression that it cannot be helped. I mean, there is help there and there is a lot of study that's going on that can uh, really make some difference. May not be, may not solve all problems, just like cancer is not yet cured, yep. but there's much help along the way. And I think it's, so the, yep. maybe I'll go there, you know, exactly. if somebody is feeling sad, or you know, feeling all the conditions that you where would they start to get a help? Right. Um, so I mean, you know, most of us should have primary care doctors, or you know, if we have children and uh, and teens, you know, they often have pediatricians. So I would start there. You know, I think it's it's worth going, you know, to your doctor and stating what is happening. Mm -hmm. um, often doctors will do screening tests. They'll do screening tests for depression and for anxiety, which are really the two most common problems in the Indian community. Um, you know, experiencing stress and tension and having it show up as sadness or, um, you know, or uh, nervousness, worry. So I would say just go to the primary care doctor uh, if you're an adult and pediatrician if you're a child and, um, you know, and they usually will uh, give you the appropriate referrals, you know, will assess the condition properly and refer you if that's needed to potentially a therapist or a psychiatrist or, um, you know, or just give you advice to what to do next. Okay. And that's a question I have. What is the difference between a therapist and a psychiatrist? And, uh, you know, also I wanted to ask you, I hear about, you know, do they give medications and people are so afraid of the medicines that you get mm -hmm. for, you know, especially mental conditions, whether it becomes addictive, a lot of things. If you could clarify some of that, I'd so appreciate that. Sure, sure. Um, so difference between therapist and psychiatrist. So therapists um, are those who do psychotherapy uh, and psychiatrists can do psychotherapy, but are also uh, allowed to prescribe medications. Uh, so in terms of training, uh, these sorts of paths that can lead to a psychotherapy career uh, are, um, so licensed mental health counselors can become therapists, uh, psychologists, you know, can become therapists, um, and uh, social workers can become therapists, licensed clinical social workers. So those are usually the people that we call therapists. Um, psychiatrists are trained in psychotherapy. Uh, we do go to, so we go to medical school and then do a residency afterwards. Uh, and in residency, you learn how to prescribe medications as well as do various forms of psychotherapy. Um, and then in the real world, psychiatrists typically do more medication management than psychotherapy uh, because insurance seems to prefer that. 
but those in private practice may choose to do more psychotherapy and less medication management, but we are trained in both. Whereas um, those who are LMHCs or LICSWs or PsyDs or PhDs uh, in psychology, those who are therapists are not allowed to prescribe medication. They have not gone to medical school and um, so they, they can't do that. There are psych NPs, nurse practitioners, who specifically are trained in prescribing medications. Uh, so that's, that's an exception to uh, the sort of duality, the kind of uh, bifurcation I was, I was describing. But um, in terms of medications, your, your question is a very good one. Um, psychiatric medications, I mean, need to be tailored to the condition. I mean, if I sort of willy-nilly give you a medication that doesn't really work, you know, for, if, if you're struggling with something, I give you the wrong medication, you're probably going to get side effects. Uh, it certainly will not work, and you're going to you're, you'll be very likely to get side effects. Um, however, if you are struggling with depression and I give you an antidepressant, it is most likely to work. Yeah. Um, you know, so when prescribing medications, we're really trying to create, uh, in a way, emotional homeostasis. So in the body, we talk about homeostasis, which is bringing the body into a state of balance. Mm -hmm. uh, so if someone's blood pressure is too high, you know, you give antihypertensives and that may you know bring the blood pressure down. If, um, if someone is diabetic, their blood sugar tends to be too high, you know, you can give medication which uh, helps them manage their blood sugar. Uh, they may need insulin if it's too severe a condition. You know, so you try to normalize and keep things in balance. And I think the same thing is the case with uh, mental health. If someone is too anxious, the, yeah. you know, prescribed medications that can bring that down if that is actually um, a compromising function. If someone is too sad, you can give them medication that brings them up to a more normal mood. Um, so I think, you know, what we try to do is uh, take away the suffering, is reduce the symptomatology, uh, and treat, you know, fairly accurately based on the condition someone is coming uh, with. And there are medications that can do that fairly well to the point where someone feels better and is not getting side effects. I have lots of patients for whom I prescribe medication that take away the problem so that they're not as symptomatic and they are living, you know, much more comfortably and they're not, you know, experiencing additional side effects. Um, so people are scared of medication, but part of that is not really understanding how they work. Um, yeah. And you know, there are real side effects that medications can cause, but my job is to make sure that I am um, helping you and not uh, causing you any additional problems. Additional so. problems, yeah, no, so that makes sense. I guess it's like any other medication, right? Whether even if uh, you take Tylenol or Advil, if you misuse them, then they are going to be in problems. So I think if you're under a doctor's supervision, we hope uh, they will not cause any um, distraction or you know problems. Just to yeah. just to add, you know, people people. So medications can, um, you know, there are some medications which are addictive, and those do have to be monitored carefully. I mean, if I'm prescribing medication which is known to be actually addictive, yeah. that I have to be more careful with. Yeah. So there are some psychiatric medications that are addictive, and and so people are right to be a little bit concerned about that. Yeah. Um, and then also. While psychiatric medications are somewhat like other medications, there is probably some. They're more. They are more hit or miss than most medical, um, than most uh, physical medications. So, in terms of the heart, I mean, if I give you a medication that is, or if your primary care doctor prescribes you a medication that's supposed to slow down your heart or decrease blood pressure, it yeah. will do that in you pretty reliably, just like it would do that in me pretty reliably. Mm -hmm. But um, psychiatric medications sometimes don't work when you think they will. Uh, and so you may have to try a second, you know, try a second one to see if this one works, whereas the first one didn't. So a little bit more hit or miss, uh, not as reliable. But again, you know, I try to get people, uh, if I'm prescribing, I try to make sure that people are taking medications that are appropriate for their condition yeah. at the correct dose, at the correct frequency, yeah. uh, and that the person is doing better on the medication and that the meds are not causing side effects. And those things all, you know, are reasonable uh, and people do get better. And, uh, but what I'm hearing from you is that uh, you should not be ignoring, you know, severe depression and uh, there is really help because, um, am I right in assuming if it is ignored, it can become a chronic condition and really um, cause difficulties, right? Yeah, right. I mean, if severe depression, I mean, is potentially deadly. I mean, we, you know, we may have heard of examples where someone was, you know, seriously depressed after not doing well academically or after a relationship breakup or, you know, for, no reason that we can exactly determine, but you know the person died by suicide. Um, you know, I think each person in, in our lives has probably encountered someone, known someone who has died by suicide. Um, and often mood disorders are associated with suicide. So, um, so severe depression, if not treated, is you know potentially deadly. So really, it has to be it has to be monitored, it has to be treated. 
Um, and you know, I think you're quite correct that if it is not, then uh, it can also become chronic. Uh, but most importantly, it can just really reduce the person's quality of life. They're not functioning. They're not happy. You know, it's like losing chunks of time in your life uh, because you're ill. Um, so just like, you know, if you had a broken leg, you wouldn't just kind of lie in bed, you know, for weeks at a time hoping for it to heal. And you go to the doctor and get it cast and you try to, uh, you know, otherwise go about your uh, your life as best as you can under those circumstances, have crutches and then get the cast off, that kind of thing, um, you know, rather than just hope it gets better. Uh, and, surely, and so. surely. That, that makes a lot of sense, a lot of sense to me. And actually, yeah. I, I would like to go on to that. I mean, I think the, peop the reason people don't get help is that they're concerned, you know, about people finding out that they went to a, you know, a mental doctor or, you know, a, thera a therapist or psychiatrist and, you know, they'll be called crazy or, you know, people have, uh, you know, cast aspirations on them. So, um, you know, what, what suggestions do you have for people who are seeking help? Right. So I think, you know, um, I mean, our audience tends to be uh, Indians uh, and often those who are Indian immigrants. And I would just reiterate that in my parents' generation, my parents came in 1960 and 1970. Um, in their, you know, in their experience in India, very few people probably yeah. had mental illness. And I think it generally was, you know, uh, it occurred at a low rate. In India, uh, if people struggled, often it was because of deaths that occurred, and they fell into depression after you know a loved one died, or maybe there was domestic abuse. You know, some things happened at home that might have caused anxiety or depression, things like that. And then, likewise, you know, after my parents came to the U.S. Uh, as immigrants, I don't think many people in their generation, uh, you know, as immigrants, struggled too much in the U.S. Yeah. But the rates are higher for my generation, those who were born here, and even more so for the generation below me. Um, uh, you know, the, at least those who are, who are younger uh, and born in the U.S. So, you know, I think one has to recognize that, um, you know, some conditions are endemic, are, are uh, you know, higher in certain places than others. So, for instance, we don't really see tetanus here too much. We don't see cholera here too much. But, you know, we may have other conditions. So, unfortunately, it seems like um, mental health problems are more common in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and it's not easily recognized by people of Indian background because they didn't see it growing up as much. And like you mentioned, there's also stigma, um, probably in part because uh, if it wasn't common back there and you know, the only people who had to see psychiatrists were probably those who were actually hearing voices and otherwise really, really um, you know, struggling in major ways. Uh, and there also weren't very many psychiatrists when you were growing up. Um, and there often are not very many psychiatrists in yeah. other countries. Uh, so, so those people, you know, those psychiatrists were reserved for people who were really you know, had, had severe mental illness. Yeah. Uh, whereas now, you know, the, the rates of mental illness are higher, at least the rates of depression, anxiety are higher um, than, uh, than, you know, we're seeing in India in the past. And a lot of people see therapists and psychiatrists. Yeah. Um, the low kya kehenge is an excellent point that I think, um, you know, often, you know, we are a collective community and we worry that uh, if one of our loved ones is going to see a therapist or psychiatrist that it is going to spread around the community. And a couple of points on that. One, um, I mean, I keep things confidential and you know, the other therapists and psychiatrists keep things confidential. Uh, two, you know, just like if you go to your primary care doctor, you're not likely to see people in that office that you know. Uh, you're going you know, at a certain time for an appointment, you get seen, you leave. Uh, and same, same kind of thing you know, if, you're, if you're seeing a therapist or psychiatrist, um, that it's you know, the whole world does not have to know. And then you know, I think like you and I, Ranjan and G have talked about, you don't have to broadcast it. Yeah. So, I mean, these things are private, just like if I went to see my primary care doctor last week, I, you know, the whole world doesn't know that. Yeah. Um, so likewise, you know, these are private things. Right. Um, and it's just better to get treatment rather than have someone suffer or have someone, you know, have an extended period of, um, you know, of not functioning. Yeah, I think very good point you brought up is that the patient the doctor confidentiality is very, very, I mean, it is legally required, not just uh, something that they do it for the sake of it, right? They are not allowed yeah. to breach confidentiality. So nobody will find out that was number one. And uh, number two, really, you can spread the message any which way you want. You know, if you're, you have friends, you know, all you need to tell them is, you know, okay, I'm not well, but I'm being taken care of. You don't need to give details exactly. of your illness to anybody. 
You can just exactly. ask your well-wishers for prayers and thoughts and you are under no obligation to share what's going on unless you want to. I mean, I think that mm -hmm. that's something that people should remember that they, they are not required <laughs> to share any of their details of their problem while asking for help. I mean, you can ask for right. blessings and support, but without sharing details that you don't want to. So I think that's a very uh, you know important point that you bring up. Um, I'll just um, ask you uh, another question is during COVID, um, have you seen some special things, especially with children when they didn't go to um, you know, school and all of that? And ha has that had an impact on, um, especially with the adolescents and you know, the teenagers, uh, anything that you can tell our audience mm -hmm. that they should watch out for with their yeah, children? Sure, sure. COVID certainly has impacted uh, children's and, and teens' uh, schooling, uh, belonging with peers, um, in the milestones that they're used to reaching, you know, so uh, people who would have, you know, kids who are juniors in high school would have gone to prom, uh, yeah. who would have had, you know, certain senior uh, events, you know, they often, you know, and graduated on time and graduated with their class yeah. uh, in front of loved ones. Often that didn't happen, you know, and there's a sense of loss around that. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of disruptions in belonging, disruptions in connecting with peers, disruptions in actual learning. Um, you know, and then the fear, you know, that we all experienced during COVID, you know, when is this going to end, the frustration we all experienced, you know, they certainly have gone through it. Um, they've sometimes had entirely virtual schooling, sometimes hybrid, sometimes back in person. And this kind of yo-yo has been difficult for a lot of kids. I see more and more kids who are kind of oppositional and just very frustrated with uh, adults, very frustrated with the world. And, you know, sometimes they're not interested in learning. They're just like, I don't care anymore. Uh, and that's been unfortunate. So I've definitely seen um, more of that Does arise that in problems. Yeah. So in our uh, next series, maybe, uh, Dr. Chandra, we can discuss uh, academic peer pressure and the impact that COVID has had on children and how uh, the parents can actually help them as they are moving, you know, maybe into high school or, you know, navigating and going into college, uh, you know, sure. what that be. So uh, we look forward to having another session with you on that um, pretty soon. Um, I'm just going to conclude with one last question for you that, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, many Indians are very spiritual um, and often they say, oh, if you're depressed, you know, just go to the temple or, you know, go to meditation or anything. So um, what suggestions do you have as to how to incorporate, you know, those kind of ideas, um, maybe as you're going and seeking help as well? Right, so I think it's very important um, I mean, it's very important for doctors to understand their patient and spirituality and to encourage patients to connect to, uh, you know, to their religion, to really, you know, utilize temples, utilize priests, um, you know, in, in healing uh, your members of your, your, you know, valued members of the community who, you know, have the expertise to counsel. Um, so I think, you know, again, I think with severe illness, if someone is not getting out of bed, is, you know, thinking very negative things, is not able to do schoolwork or go to work, you know, that person probably has to see a doctor. Yeah. Um, because talking is not likely to be enough. There might be something biological happening, which requires biological treatment like medication. Um, but, you know, for milder conditions, milder situations where someone is, you know, maybe having existential angst is really, you know, just not sure where life is going, you know, yeah. the kinds of things that, you know, Americans will go to their pastors for or their yeah. priests for, um, you know, likewise, I mean, we should absolutely be going, you know, to, um, you know, our spiritual uh, healers, to, you know, to those who have the expertise that can counsel. Um, you know, you've talked to me about the Bhagavad Gita and all the lessons from the Gita, they're just innumerable. Um, but our holy books really contain so much information uh, you know, the ancient Hindus knew so much, and it's really useful, you know, to be able to tap into that, uh, you know, for healing purposes. So, um, you yeah, know, if someone is not seriously, you know, struggling, then absolutely, you know, one, one should go for spiritual treatment first. That's beautiful. In fact, I often think that uh, what you said, which is that the second generation, you know, people here and younger to you are, you know, seem to be getting more, in, you know, so there are more symptoms, mental health issues that seem to be coming up. And I think for people, parents to maybe connect them spiritually to their heritage might be useful as they grow right. up. Uh, it might give exactly. a good support system, you know, almost as importantly as teaching them about math and science is to mm -hmm. teach them, you know, options to uh, of spirituality that they can kind of hold on to when they are in trouble so that that's a good point that you bring yeah. up so so dr chidra this was really really and, very and, and, fascinating any other comments you would like to make 
Yeah, I was going to say that I think, you know, there's the connection to one's spiritual heritage, to one's cultural heritage, this, you know, is, is just, it's good for the soul. It's good at a very deep level uh -huh. to be connected to family, to community, to spirituality. These are good for you at a deep level. And, uh, you know, often in America, we're with our, with our excessive individualism, with our striving for material gains and, you know, to impress others, we often lose track of, uh, you know, of the importance of these connections. Right. So true, so true. I'm glad you said that. And I think for mental health purposes, it sounds like having those connections. Um, I think I saw somewhere also the brain itself, you know, uh, the, the connections in the brain change depending on the yeah. kind of training and other things that uh, you have. So yeah. uh, that's a beautiful comment you're bringing up. And uh, really what I'm taking away from your session today is that everybody deserves to be happy and everybody can get there. There are many paths to it. And, uh, you know, definitely Western medicine has some great options and, uh, you know, psychiatry and therapy is nothing to be afraid of. In fact, it's a very, very supportive thing. And the doctors um, have done a lot of research. There's a lot of understanding that is there and uh, nobody should feel like, uh, you know, a mental illness is any different than a physical illness and uh, they should just seek help as and how it is appropriate. Thank you so much, Dr. Chandra, for your time today. And uh, we look forward to the next series, very important one <laughs> on how to deal with academic pressure, especially for children who are graduating at a very, very special time. Thank you so much, Dr. Chandra. Namaste. Thank you so much, Pranjanji. Namaste.